Heavenly Father, Lord, I come before you this morning, before your people. Lord, and I just ask, Father, for a double portion of your spirit this morning as, I, as we go through this study together. I pray, Lord, that we would understand and see Christ as the focus in the heavenly sanctuary, in the ministry he did on this earth, and the ministry he does right now in heaven for all of us, for your children. Father, please be with us as we study this morning. Fill me with your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for hearing. Thank you, Lord, for answering. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'm just going to wait for a thumbs up. I have a thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. The sanctuary opens. This is now our, uh, well, our fifth, actually. This is the fourth feast in the year out of seven in the Jewish economy. But we've done this one now. This is the fifth one because we started with the Feast of Tabernacles. We started with the second coming, and that was back in February. This time we're going to talk about Pentecost. Now, if we look at the calendar, we see that Pentecost now comes kind of somewhere more between closer to the spring feast, so the red X is, or the red check mark is there. It's on the 6th of Sivan. So the first four, Passover on the 14th, Unleavened Bread begins on the, 20, on the 15th, goes to the 21st, and the first fruits is on the 16th. That was of the first month of Nisan. They represent Christ on the cross as our Passover, Christ the sinless bread laying in the tomb on the Sabbath. And the first fruits, the resurrection, the proof of the harvest to come. But where did he go after that? He went to heaven. And so now when we consider this next feast and discuss it, we need to really understand what he's still doing. Because a lot of times when we talk about the day of Pentecost, and we talk about the Holy Spirit being poured out, and they spoke in tongues, and the, and the gospel went to the world, Not a lot of times we think about what actually happened in heaven on that day, because the center is Christ. So we start here in Hebrews, Hebrews 8, 1 through 3. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. This simply means that Christ could not begin the heavenly ministry in the sanctuary until he had been crucified and had his blood, his perfect sacrifice. So this is the next step in the ministry of Christ in heaven, is the beginning of the sanctuary ministry. And that began on the day of Pentecost. In Hebrews 9, 8, through 11, and 12, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the sanctuary, this is Greek word 39, and it can be translated as holiest, holy place, or sanctuary. In this case, a lot of translations either put holiest of all or they put holy places. Actually, I primarily use the King James, but the English Standard Version actually does the best job in the book of Hebrews in translating G39. That the way into the sanctuary was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. Everything that took place through the Jewish economy through the year, every year that same cycle was speaking of a time that would come in the ministry of Christ on this earth that would happen once through history. One sacrifice, one resurrection, one outpouring at the beginning of the gospel, ministry in heaven. Then we're going to go through the rest of the feasts. But this all had to happen after he came. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the holy place or the sanctuary once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So this is what's happened in heaven since we last covered the feasts and first fruits. Let's talk about, uh, let's go back to Acts though. Let's look at the Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, and catch up to what happened after first fruits. He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. 
For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So there was a promise. There was a promise from Christ that you would receive something after he left. So it mentions 40 days in verse 3. So 40 days after resurrection, he was there among his disciples and on this earth. Then he left. There was a period of 10 days from the time that he left until Pentecost came. So there we have 50 days. Now, if we look at Leviticus 23, 15, and 16, this is where we have the description of the, the Pentecost and, and where, where, how you keep it and where it starts from. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, that's talking about the first fruits, or after the Sabbath, that's from first fruits. The, the Sabbath it's referring to is unleavened bread. If you remember when Christ was crucified, it was on Friday. On Sabbath, that seventh day Sabbath, it was a high Sabbath because it was the first day of unleavened bread, which was a Sabbath. That's what the Sabbath is being referred to here. From the day after you brought the from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, that's the next day, first fruits, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Another way to read that would be seven weeks, because each Sabbath was a, was a week of seven days. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So that was what the Jews kept every single year. 50 days after first fruits, it was, a, it was a festival, it was a feast for a harvest. It was celebrating the harvest that was coming in. Now, when Christ was resurrected, that was the barley. Christ is represented by the barley harvest. The rest of us, the rest of humanity that's being redeemed is wheat. And you probably have heard the parable of the wheat and the tares in the New Testament. So that's the wheat, that is Pentecost. Now, we have to understand what's really happening on Pentecost by looking back in time in ancient Israel and look at a similar situation that took place with the same amount of time after the Passover. Because where did the Passover come from? Wasn't the Passover from the exodus from Egypt, from the delivery from Egypt, right? So let's go from there. In the third month, this is Exodus 19.1, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They came to Sinai. And you remember what was Sinai was for? It was to receive the law. This is from uh, Signs of the Times, March 7, 7, 1878, paragraph 1. God had commanded Moses to bring his people to this place, Sinai, of natural solitude and sublimity, that they might hear his voice. Hear his voice. And receive the statute book of heaven. Now, for many years, Pentecost by the Jewish people, has been a celebration of receiving the law of God from Mount Sinai. I don't know how many of us knew that. I didn't really fully know that until I'd actually done the research and the study for this. Is that Pentecost was celebrating the receiving of the commandments of God and hearing his voice on Mount Sinai. Signs of the Times, uh, same article, paragraph 2. 50 days, once again, 50 days. 50 days previous to this, the pillar of fire had lighted the path through the Red Sea that God had miraculously opened before the marching multitudes of his people. So we have the timings exactly the same. We have Passover. We have that deliverance. We have 50 days later, they come to Sinai. We have the feasts, 50 days after first fruits, Pentecost. So what happened at Mount Sinai? What was going on at Mount Sinai will tell us a lot about Pentecost. Exodus 19.11, And let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Acts 2.1, the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Were God's people all in one accord in one place in Mount Sinai? They most certainly were. So were the disciples, the 120 in the upper room. Now... We're holding two things in our idea. We're, holding, we're, we're looking at two basic things on the day of Pentecost. What took place with the disciples and what took place with Christ in the heavenly sanctuary? That's the part that's really the focus we need to remember. So we're going to look at what happened with Christ on the day of Pentecost, what happened with the disciples on the day of Pentecost, how they're related, and understanding them through typology, through what happened in ancient Israel, through one coming to Mount Sinai after 50 days, and two, the consecration of the earthly sanctuary with Aaron being anointed as high priest. 
So what took place to enact, to, to, to basically begin and consecrate and anoint the temple, the sanctuary in the desert, is something that we would understand would be happening in heaven as Christ begins his sanctuary ministry there. Leviticus 8.4. We're going to come back to Leviticus 8 and look at what happened with Aaron. But I just want to see these all stacked together. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. That's to prepare them to be, to be washed and prepared and, and to be anointed. And the congregation was gathered together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. God's people gathered around Mount Sinai. God's people gathered around the congregation of the tabernacle to prepare for the anointing. God's people all together in one place in the upper room. Okay. So let's go back and look at what took place at the time for Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, 10 through 11 and 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Think about that. There's a, uh, you know, what took place in the Old Testament in Israel gives us a type of what takes place spiritually in the future. So what is God's people, what's happening to them? They're being cleaned. They're being prepared to meet God. Wash their clothes, consecrate them. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. They were preparing to meet God. This was the preparation of ancient Israel at Sinai. Acts, the apostles in the upper room, Acts 1, 13 and 14. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. These, and then it lists a bunch of names. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, what took place, though, in that time? This is from Acts of the Apostles, page 36 and 37, paragraphs 1 and 2. As the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. So when we look at all these things together, what were God's people doing at Mount Sinai? They were preparing, they were consecrating themselves, they were washing. They were just coming out of Egypt. They were learning what it meant to be holy before God, to be sanctified before God. They were learning. The apostles, what were they doing? They were doing the same thing. They had more understanding than the Jews did, than God's people coming out of Egypt at that time, but they were doing the same thing because it represented a spiritual cleansing that they needed to have before they met Christ or before they were anointed. They humbled themselves. But now let's talk about Aaron because this is what would be happening with Christ. Leviticus 8, 6 through 10 and verse 12. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put the tunic on him, girded him with the sash, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. And he girded him with the intricately woven band of the ephod, with it tied the ephod on him. So he's being, he's being strapped on these ornaments of the sanctuary, these robes, these things that signified his position as high priest, representing Christ to come. Then he put the breastplate on him. This breastplate had 12 precious gems in three rows, and they were all the names of the tribes of Israel. So what was on the chest? What was on the heart of the high priest? It was all of his people. Christ is wearing the burden for his people's salvation on his chest. They put the breastplate on him, and he put Urim and Thurim in the bless, into the breastplate, and he put the mitre on his head. Also the mitre on its front, he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He was crowned. He was crowned. As also Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Christ was crowned and he was anointed. In Revelation 5, 6, we have a brief glimpse of him in heaven after the crucifixion and his ascension. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. He appeared before, before his Father and before all of heaven to become our high priest on that day of Pentecost. In Hebrews 5, verses 1, 4, 5, and 9, and 10, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for, thing, for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor to himself, 
But he who is called by God, just as Aaron was, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. So there we have, you can see scripturally, you can see when we're talking about Aaron, we're talking about a type of Christ to come to be anointed in the most holy, to be, sorry, anointed in the sanctuary. And having been perfected, he became the author of our eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek was a very interesting character we don't know a lot about in the Old Testament. Abraham met him, and Levi paid tithes while still in his loins, which is another, that's righteousness by faith and corporate identity. But Melchizedek, the name means, what does it mean? King of peace. Melchizedek was the king of, Sa was the king of Salem. Salem means peace. He was the king of peace. But he also received tithes, which means that he had to be a man of God, a priest. So he was a priest and he was a king. And so is our Lord and Savior. Now in Psalm 133, verses 1 and 2, we have an interesting description recorded there of what took place when Aaron was anointed. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Isn't that what they did when they came together on the Feast of Pat on the Pentecost? Isn't that what they did around Mount Sinai? Isn't that what they did when they consecrated Aaron? It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down the, upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and it went down to the skirts of his garments. When Aaron was anointed, the oil of anointing flowed all the way down to his feet. And remember that Aaron is a type of Christ representing what will take place when Christ is anointed in the actual cosmic plan of salvation. Ephesians 5.23 For the husband is head of the wife, also Christ is head of the church, and he is savior of the body. So Christ, anointed, is the head. His body, his church, is below him. It's his body. When Aaron was anointed, the Holy Spirit filled his whole body. When Christ was anointed, he received the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit went to his body, to us, to his people on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all in one accord in one place. And he poured out some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And all God's people, the 120 in the upper room at that time, were anointed with the Holy Spirit. Let's pick up here with Acts 2. This is Peter now, towards the end of his sermon on that day, verses 32 through and 36. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, he's right there right now, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this, which you see, which you now see and hear. Peter understood, filled with the Holy Spirit, exactly what happened in heaven, that Christ had been anointed as the high priest for his people. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ, both king and anointed. Christ means anointed, anointed priest. Now, this is something that's very interesting. We look at Israel coming out of Egypt. And we know that they are, they, they are God's people in the type, in the historical type, coming out of Egypt, being delivered, and then coming to meet him on Mount Sinai. And this is Paul in Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and into the sea. And who is Moses in the Bible? A type of Christ. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. And what was that spiritual food? They literally received bread from heaven. Were not the disciples baptizing in the name? Was not Christ himself baptized? Did not Christ give to his people this bread that was broken, his body? 
you have communion. You have communion being represented here in type. They all drank the same spiritual drink. Drink this cup, this blood, this my life that's laid down for you. They drank water that came from a rock. For they all drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So you have this, this great symbolism of God's people coming out of Egypt, being baptized, being given communion, and then preparation to be anointed by him. And that's exactly what happened with the disciples. Now let's look at uh, what God said to Moses to talk, tell his people at this time. This is Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. That's what he said about his people at Mount Sinai. Special treasure, kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And let's take a look in the New Testament, Peter, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, talking to the Christians, the new Christians. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of God, of him who called you out of darkness into its marvelous light, out of Egypt and into the wilderness to dwell with him in tabernacles. You have a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, the same things that God told Moses to say to his people then. Peter is saying to God's people today. Verse 10, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That message is still to us today. Called out of the world, anointed with his spirit, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. What happened at Mount Sinai? The law was given. The law was given to God's people. And we have this account of Moses having been up there 40 days. And what happened? Exodus 34, 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Christ's presence in Moses, his skin reflecting the glory of God, what happened? He received the law of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all, as a Christian, this is our experience, we're supposed to be our experience. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. That's in here. Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And how is it done by? Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And what was poured out on Pentecost? The Spirit of the Lord. So now the law of God is a transcript of his character. That's Christ's Object Lessons 305, paragraph 3. So what was Moses receiving? He was receiving the character of God. He was in the presence, and by beholding, he was becoming changed into his likeness, recreating God, recreating the image that he created us in originally. And he mentions this in the Old Testament even, of this new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. And so who is that today? That would be us, his own special people, a royal priesthood. This is the covenant I will make with you today, he says. Says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And how does he do it? just as by the Spirit of the Lord and by beholding Him in His Word. This is what Mount Sinai represented. Now, for many years after, of course, the Jewish people always celebrated this day as the day that they received the law of God. And what is the law? A transcript of His character. Celebration of God writing the law in our hearts. Now, the promise he made in a couple of places to wait for the Holy Spirit are here. Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, and 
tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Power coming down from on high to you. Matthew 3, 11. I indeed baptize, this is John the Baptist, I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Acts 1, 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, even in Kelowna. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit. But what does it say? It says from on high, from down to us, and fire. Let's take a look at what happened that day. The description, Acts 2, verses 2 through 6 and 15. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, from on high. What's happening up, what's happening up there? Christ is being anointed. That's what's happening. The sound of Christ being anointed with the Holy Spirit. They heard the Holy Spirit coming as a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them on divided tongues as a fire and one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under earth. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. How is it they speak this language? Aren't these not Galileans? Galileans? Well, the answer in verse 15 is very interesting because it puts a time stamp. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. The third hour of the day is nine o'clock in the morning. That is the time when the first fruits was waved on the resurrection morning. It's also the time when the grain offering was offered in, as well. Nine o'clock. God is right on time. You might think he's late. You might think he delays his coming, but I can assure you he is right on time. For these are not drunk, as you might suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. Now let's go back and look at Mount Sinai. Let's look at the description of what happened at Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, 16, and 18. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire from above, coming down in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Now, we have this uh, description of the, of the Holy Spirit being poured out in Acts 4, a little bit later in the story in the time of Christ. Acts 4.31, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God in boldness. Were they not speaking the word of God in boldness on the day of Pentecost? Right? So... The Holy Spirit being poured out, fire, speaking in tongues, God's word being proclaimed with boldness. Now let's look at what happened at Mount Sinai again. But this is the recounting of the, what happened in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4, 33 and 36. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard and live? Out of heaven, he let you hear his voice that he might instruct you on earth. He showed you his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. Did not God's people speak the words of God at Pentecost, and they heard the words of God being spoken through them? The Holy Spirit, right? Very similar things happen. Now, this is what's really interesting. In Jewish historical tradition, they understand that when God spoke commandments, on that day at Pentecost, this is, what they, this is what they recorded in their history, that God spoke in 70 languages at once. Just like on the day of Pentecost with the disciples. This is amazing. God's plan of salvation given to his people in the sanctuary, in shadows, in types, exactly explaining, and the things that occurred back then, exactly shadowing, foretelling of what would happen when he comes and what his plan of salvation would look like. 
and exactly where we would be along the way that we'd not doubt anything, but always remember to know where we are and to be ready. Now let's go back to the description of the day of Pentecost in Leviticus 23, 16 and 17. Now I'm going to go one verse further. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Now let's talk about the new grain offering. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two-tenths of an epa. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. Now, the wave sheaf was just, you know, the harvested barley, and it was waved on the first fruits. Now, this is talking about wheat that had been cut, had been ground, had been processed. Think about what the wheat represents. That's us. That's God's people being made into fine flour processed and now baked with leaven now leaven it either represents one of two things it either represents sin or it represents the holy spirit based on the context of where it's been used in the previous uh, sermon last month we talked about first fruits or it's actually two months ago we talked about the uh, sinless bread the unleavened bread the leaven represented sin but we also know that it represents the holy spirit matthew 13 33 the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till all was leavened. So the Holy Spirit, God's people taken, refined, processed, if you will, refined and then mixed with the Holy Spirit until the whole thing is filled with the Holy Spirit and then it is baked into a beautiful loaf and presented before the Lord. It's interesting, though. It mentions a woman. What is a woman in the Bible? The church. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, the Holy Spirit, which in a church, the people are come together to grow together in unity. How pleasant is it for brethren to dwell together in unity is the verse that we got, Aaron's beard going all the way down to his feet. The context of Aaron being anointed and the Holy Spirit going through his whole body as it did to Christ's body, his church, on the day of Pentecost. The verse before it says, brethren, to dwell together in unity. The Holy Spirit is a unifying force. It is a force. It is a power. It is God himself in his people recreating the image of God in man again writing the law of God, his character, into your hearts. The plan of salvation. Now, it says two loaves. Why do you think it's two loaves? Why not just one loaf? Why two? I have people here. They're quiet. They're behind masks. They're not supposed to, maybe they're not supposed to talk. Two loaves. Well, let's look at Acts 2, 41 and 47, and see what happened that day, because there was a harvest. There were first fruits that day. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That makes sense for it to be one loaf. But what about the second loaf? Well, we have to understand that the day of Pentecost actually is a type of what will also happen at the end. Because remember, Pentecost is about the sanctuary in heaven being opened and being consecrated and the, and the plan of salvation now moves to the, to the holy place and Christ is now our high priest there. It's the beginning of his ministry in the sanctuary. But when it comes time for him to close his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary from the most, most holy place, the Holy Spirit will be poured out again. The Holy Spirit comes in the beginning and it comes at the end, the early rain and the latter rain. Joel 2, 28 and 29, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and the young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The second loaf is the latter rain. The first loaf is the early rain, the second loaf is the latter rain. Great controversy. This is chapter 38, the final warning, the time of the, the midnight cry, the time of Revelation 18. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. 
this is what we have to look forward to. When we look, when we look back and look at the Feast of Pentecost, we look what took place on that day and understood, understand what happened when the sanctuary was opened in heaven. When the sanctuary is ready to be closed in heaven, there will be a similar outpouring even greater than before. And this is the reason why we are here today. This is the reason why there is a Seventh-day Adventist movement. It's for this purpose. You are the antitypical 120 in the upper room. That's what we're here for. And so looking at their experiencing, looking what they went through to be ready to receive that spirit is what we need to be focused on today. The Feast of Pentecost is amazing. It appears right in the middle. You have the first three feasts. You have the courtyard of the sanctuary. You have Pentecost right there in the middle in that year, and that is the beginning. And then you have the three fall feasts, and that's the end. Let's finish with this verse. This is a verse that we, we did the Feast of Tabernacles first in the series back in February. We started with the second coming. And there we talked about on this last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. That was the Feast of Tabernacles. He was there. That was the day. That was the great day that represented the marriage supper in heaven. That last day of the great feast, he stood there and he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And behind him there were these, they were doing the water ceremony, the pouring out of the water and the wine, representing the Holy Spirit, the, light, you know, the Spirit and the blood, the wine, his life. And six months later, he would be on a cross, and they would be literally fulfilled as the, as the spear would pierce his side, and out would flow water and blood. So here is Christ on the day of Feast of Tabernacles, the great day of the feast, and he's talking about something, he's referring to something behind him as a symbol of what was going to happen on the Passover. Now verse 39, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified, anointed, crowned. You have, all, you have three feasts in, that, in those verses. On the day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the great day, the sacrifice, referring to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in his beginning ministry as the high priest in heaven. I think it's amazing. You know, we talk about the gospel, and the world talks about the gospel, all the churches, but, you know, unless you really see the depth of the sanctuary, what it means and what he's doing, I mean, there's so much that's missing from the gospel that's in the world today. If you look at all that, you know, this is not about feast keeping. This is, I, this is, we don't keep, I, there's no need for this. It's all been fulfilled. But what was fulfilled, what's being fulfilled, tells us exactly where we are today and what we are to do and what our experience should be like. To understand what it is to partake of the, the sinless bread. To look at, at first fruits and the promise of the resurrection and the new life. Not just a physical one, but a spiritual one. A literal change of heart. And the promise of the Holy Spirit that was given to us, to his people on that day, is still available today. When we ask for the Holy Spirit, we are asking for the same outpouring that the disciples received. The one that is to come is to be greater than that. The latter rain is what fully ripens the harvest. This is where we're at. We are at that place when we need to really begin to pray and seek for the latter rain. We can see the world, we can see it grinding to a halt. We can see lockdowns and restrictions and nations warring against, you know, ethnos against ethnos. We see civil war issues, we see ethnic fighting. We see a lot of disunity. But where are we to appear? Are we not to appear to God in front before him as a people united? As the 120 were in that upper room on the day of Pentecost to finish the work. That's where we are. We have a couple more feats to look at in the future. We'll talk about the trumpets, and we'll talk about the Day of Atonement. But this is a really special one. Because what God showed his people on that day, on Sinai, what he made manifest to them on that fiery mountain, and he made manifest to them on that day of Pentecost, 
is the power of God available to you every single day of your life? How can we neglect such a great blessing? It is my prayer that that we will seek him with hearts that are hungry, with hearts that are thirsty, because the promise is clear that he will give to drink if you are thirsty. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, for this, for this people, your people, to receive of this spirit that you promise. Lord, it is not our works, it is your work that you do in us. Our plans, our, our ideas, our ambitions, all our, our schemes to do things are nothing, Lord, in your grand scheme, your grand plan for the plan of salvation and for the reaping of this earth. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would turn to you with with fasting and contrition of heart to seek this spirit, to receive it today, that we might finish, that we might see you with the eye of faith in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place, preparing to close up the work and that we would catch up to where you are today and remember why we're here, that we would all be with you together at that marriage at that marriage table in heaven thank you father for for hearing us this morning thank you for sending your spirit in jesus name i pray amen